all goes back to understanding a system. And that is the way I taught the Japanese top management in 1950. The aim of the system. Draw a flow diagram. What happens? What happens next? And in that flow diagram, anybody may see what his job is. A flow diagram is an organization chart. Anybody that works there, maybe pupil, maybe teacher, maybe principal, maybe a parent, can see what his job is. The problem is that a manufacturing flowchart, what Dr. Deming taught the Japanese, does not appear to apply to a school or a hospital or a police station, for instance. But it does if we change the labels. We do not mean to imply that educating young people is exactly the same as making a ton of steel. It isn't. But understanding the system in the plant or in the school is the same. And to help us understand, Dr. Deming has expert help, a system sciences educator, Dr. Russell Acoff. The characteristic way of management that we have taught in the Western world is take a complex system, divide it into parts, and then try to manage each part as well as possible. And if that's done, the system as a whole will behave well. And that's absolutely false, because it's possible to improve the performance of each part taken separately and destroy the system at the same time. This is not a criticism of students, parents, teachers, principals, superintendents, or anyone else in education. This is not about people in the system. This is about the system itself. Look what the educational system does to creativity. Uh, Every child learns at a very early stage that when they're asked the question in school, they must first ask themselves a question. What answer does the asker expect? That's the way you get through school, by providing people with the answers they expect. Now, the one thing about an answer that somebody else expects is it can't be creative because it's already known. What we ought to be trying to do with children is get them to give us answers that we don't expect. What we produce is a group of people who think in the way we have been thinking for years, rather than departing and developing new concepts and new ways of understanding. Yes, a check block system. Which is the right answer? A, B, or C? Mark it off. That is not teaching. That the student learns information. He learns the right answer, marks it off. That's right. I'd rather Johnny would tell me under what circumstances would A be the right answer? Under what circumstances would it be the wrong answer? Same for B and C. Right. And with a lot of things, most everything maybe, there is no right answer. But I think the point is that while a fact does exist, by itself it isn't enough. We have to know what context that fact is in and how we are going to use it. There's a very basic distinction between the various forms of content of the human mind. There's data, information, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. The educational system never makes a distinction between them. And as a result, children come through the system with a great deal of information, very little knowledge, and no understanding, and virtually zero wisdom. Data are individual facts, symbols that represent objects or events. You hear scientists talking about raw data. What they mean is they have facts, but until those facts can be processed, they have no meaning. They don't tell us anything. When data are processed, they become information. Information answers the reporter's questions who, what, when, where, and how. To answer how-to questions, you need knowledge. Then from explanations, you get understanding. Children do not constantly ask why, only to drive their parents crazy. They are trying to learn, to acquire knowledge, to understand the world around them. Finally, as you understand, you may acquire wisdom, which is the ability to see and evaluate the long-term consequences of our actions. The problem with most education is that it rarely gets to wisdom, or understanding, or knowledge. Most education is devoted to information. How many people did the very best job they could? 
David Langford, now a quality education consultant, introduced the Deming Quality Method to Mount Edgecombe High School in Sitka, Alaska. Uh, it's now estimated that you only remember about 10% of what you learned for those tests while you were in school. So if you really think about that, there's a lot of waste in that system if you're simply focused on trying to uh, memorize information so I can use that later on. How do we design a system which distributes its effort more evenly across these types of content of the human mind? See, information is contained in descriptions, knowledge and instruction, understanding and explanation, and we don't explain reality to children. I passed the course by acquiring information. That's right. Put head full of information. Yeah. All the capitals of all the states. That's right. That's not, that's not knowledge. Absolutely not. I couldn't give a, I couldn't care less right. about such a thing. But what's really important is the ability to, the ability to learn how to learn. That no matter what situation I find myself in, I'm able to assess what's there, perhaps collect some data that would give me some information about how I might uh, proceed and understand the situation, then learn how to access other resources such as other people or teams of people or, or access resources, resources through technology that would enable you to uh, find information that you might need. So what you're really talking about is the ability, ability to learn how to learn. Despite how it often appears, most educators do not believe that all of education is about passing standardized tests. But what we do in schools now grows out of how we think, and how we think grows out of the curiosity of children. Uh, in the Renaissance, when man began to investigate the nature of man and the environment in which man lived, he also invented a way of thinking, and he actually copied it from children. If you look at a child, when a child is given something they have never seen before, and they're confronted with the need to understand it, a child goes through a three-step process. The first thing they do is take it apart. The second thing they do is try to understand the behavior of each part taken separately. And then they try to aggregate the understanding of the parts into an understanding of the whole. That's analysis. Please remember that analysis means to separate the whole into parts and study each part individually. And analysis became the dominant mode of thought in the Western world for almost 400 years. In fact, even today, we use analysis and thinking as synonymous terms. That's the way we manage. We take corporations and schools apart into departments or disciplines, try to run each one, and then aggregate them into a whole. You cannot explain the behavior of a system by analysis. You can reveal its structure and say how it works, but you can't say why it works the way it does. Now, a simple example is the British drive on the other side of the street. Their steering wheel is on the right, ours is on the left. Now, I can give you and automobile mechanics all the English and American cars you want and disassemble them from now to doomsday, and you'll never explain why one drives on the right and the other drives on the left. Because explanation never lies inside of a system. It lies no, outside. A system cannot understand itself. Right. Dr. Baker says in the Ford Company, a system cannot understand itself. You can learn all about ice, know very little about water. He said that if you want to find out how something works, you use analysis. But if you want to understand why it works the way it does, then you use synthesis. Analysis tells you how, synthesis tells you why. You need both, and they are both important. You knew that? No. I read it in Dr. Acoff's book, Creating the Corporate Future. A very simple example would be if you took one each of every make of automobile available in the United States and brought them together and had a group of engineers decide which one had the best engine, perhaps a Rolls Royce, <coughs> uh, which had the best transmission, which the best alternator, and for each part required for an automobile found the best one available. If you then instructed the engineers to take those parts off the automobiles and assemble the best possible automobile out of all the best parts, you would not get an automobile. No, it would not run. No, the parts wouldn't fit, no. and that's the critical part about a fifth system. They would not work together. 
So it's the working together that's the main contribution to systemic thinking, as opposed to working apart separately. Yeah, so easy it is to observe, to see, to understand, and yet people do not know that. The performance of the whole is never the sum of the performance of the parts taken separately, but it's the product of their interactions. And therefore, the basic managerial idea introduced by systems thinking is that to manage a system effectively, you must focus on the interactions of the parts rather than their behavior taken separately. That would be the aim of the system. The system must be defined, the aim must be stated, and it must be managed. When you're making a product or delivering a service, quality is what will help a customer and entice him to buy it. Now, what do we mean by quality in education? We mean the ability to think or to pass tests. The question of how do you get people to think systemically, I think was best answered by a vice president of Bell Telephone Laboratories back in the 1950s, when he invented a procedure that's come to be known as idealized redesign. What he said is the only way that we can think creatively about a system is to assume it was destroyed last night. It no longer exists. So the education system in the United States was destroyed last night. Now, if you could do whatever you wanted to right now to replace it, what would you do if you were completely unconstrained? His argument was, if you don't know what you would do when you can do whatever you want right now, then how can you possibly know what to do when you can't do whatever you want? That forces you to study the whole instead of the parts taken separately. So in idealized redesign, you design the system as a whole and then derive the property of the parts from the properties of the whole, as opposed to analytical design, where you start by taking the parts and extracting the properties of the whole from the characteristics of the parts. We spent an awful lot of time improving the quality of things that ought to be destroyed. Isn't that interesting? So right you are. You can take almost any aspect of our society. We haven't rethought the design of it for many years. And as they become dysfunctional, we uh, institutionalize that dysfunctionality. We have to redesign most of our products and not merely improve the quality of the existing product. You may uh, reduce defects to zero, go out of business. That's right, that's exactly right. Something else has to happen. And that's what uh, this whole process is, gets you to look at, about how your system operates, how you can improve the system, how you can work with uh, society, or if you're in business, an external customer, to work with them to improve processes, or I can, how I can work with a supplier or a source where students come from, if that's parents and elementaries and that uh, process as a whole, instead of just trying to improve tiny parts of that system. Because we've been able to do that for years and it hasn't given, given us any systemic change or improvement in the whole process. As we look at the whole system of education, a lot of what we believe about teaching and learning turns out to be wrong. And most discussions of education assume that the best way to learn a subject is to have it taught to you. That's nonsense. We've all learned our first language without having it taught to us. We never learned a second language as well through a teacher. And most of what we use professionally, we learned on the job, not in school. Most of what we learn in school is either obsolete uh, or out of date or wrong. On the other hand, anybody who's ever taught knows that teaching is a wonderful way to learn. And therefore, if we want people to learn, we have to make them teach. Mm -hmm.